We started Feed the Future because we know that investments in science, technology, and innovation can help end hunger and poverty around the world. Feed the Future is about giving people the tools to move themselves out of dependency and to a place of self-sufficiency, growth, and increased prosperity. Science and technology has helped mankind ever since uh, the early civilization in the field of environment, medicine, most importantly in agriculture, like during the Green Revolution, where a billion lives were saved. We have a big challenge of increasing food production on a shrinking natural resource base with a much smaller environmental footprint. Breeders over centuries, they've been improving um, their materials. Over time, we've gone from the very first maize, Chiosinte, to the current domesticated maize. Farmers are always looking for high yields to ensure that they are feeding their families and they have surplus to sell. There's still a need for increased adoption of conventional technologies. But conventional approaches alone cannot solve all agricultural problems. Innovation and biotechnology are important in several ways. Biotechnology and genetic engineering bring in an extra level of variation within the makeup of crops. Within Feed the Future, we've made investments in research and in some cases biotechnology a priority so that farmers have choices to use the types of technologies that can help improve their, the nutritional status of their children and families, help protect their crops from low rainfall years, and help uh, improve the value of what they're producing so they can earn more money. We are partnering with Feed the Future in some of the most important staple food crops in the Sub-Saharan Africa. We are working to develop BT cowpea resistant varieties. The BT cowpea project was born out of that very challenge where insect resistance could not be identified within cultivated cowpeas. Rice it has a number of challenges on drought, so we are developing water use efficient rice, nitrogen use efficient rice, and do one resistant to high salinity. They are now going to introduce um, provitamin A into millet, and they've done that for bananas, and they've introduced weevil resistance into sweet potatoes. Biotechnology is already showing great science of helping farmers, and this technology has actually increased the profits that farmers have been getting by increasing yields by about 15 to 20 percent, then they are able to reduce poverty, they are able to take their children to school, they are able to access health care, they also regain their dignity. It's not just enough to develop new technologies that can resist drought or help crops resist insects. You need a supportive policy environment in order for those technologies to reach the farmer. We believe that countries and farmers should have a choice about the kind of technologies that are available to them to solve their problems. We need regulatory systems that are cost effective. They should be rigorous, but they should be science-based regulations that look at the evidence on a case-by-case -case basis. We also have to make sure that there is an enabling environment for the very exciting biotechnology-based varieties and innovations in animal science, that there is a regulatory system in place and developed by the government, enforced by the government, based on scientific principles to keep the, the country safe as well as productive. This is the first time we've seen extreme poverty go down on every single continent, including Africa. Part of why that's happening is this reinvestment in agricultural research and in nutrition. We need to act today to invest in new technology, new partnerships, business partnerships, engagements with civil society, and by measuring real concrete results, we think we can help end hunger as we know it. Good morning again. Now it's my pleasure to introduce the next panel. It's going to talk about going from research to scaling to sustainability. Um, I think you can all tell from, from the video and from uh, Dr. Wotecki's remarks, we're all very, very excited about, uh, about the, the re, reinvestment in agricultural research that we've, we've been accomplishing, we've been working on through Feed the Future. Um, but 
This panel is about how to take those research innovations to scale in the field. Back in, back in 2012, uh, speaking to the CGIR board of directors and, and leaders at IFCRI, Administrator Shaw said, uh, game-changing technologies can only actually change the game uh, when they are adopted by farmers. So he really set us on a path in USAID and Feed the Future to thinking through what are those challenges that we can seize to make sure that these exciting innovations that we have um, are reaching farmers at scale. I want to just take a minute uh, to say what we've been doing at USAID and Feed the Future uh, before turning to the panel. And you'll notice that, that there's, there's, there's a missing person on the panel, and that's our moderator, uh, Johannes Lin, uh, from Brookings Institution, a former World Bank vice president and uh, an expert on scaling, was, as he wrote to me, felled by the flu. Uh, so I think we're, we're, we're lucky uh, in this conference. He's the only person that, that we've lost due to sickness, but I'll be taking his, his place as moderator today. But just, just a minute on, on how we're trying to address this challenge uh, in, in Feed the Future. We started off by, by thinking about this as, a, as a identifying great, the next great innovative technologies. What do we have on the shelf that's ready to go? We thought about drip irrigation. We thought about this range of climate resilient uh, seeds. We thought about urea deep fertilizer. Um, a whole range of technologies seemingly waiting, uh, raring to go uh, to be adopted by farmers. As we started talking to our, our USAID missions, our implementing partners, our, our foundation partners, um, the CGIR centers, uh, the, the National Ag Research Systems, we started realizing that, you know, of course, you know, it is absolutely essential to have these innovative technologies, but we have such a unique opportunity in Feed the Future to, to marry the opportunity of the technology uh, with these partnerships and the work that we've been doing now for uh, through Feed the Future and before on value chain development. I think we've been talking about this really over the past couple of days, you know, how we think about removing the constraints, whether they're financial constraints, uh, whether they're market development constraints, and, and essentially opening a pathway uh, for technology adoption at scale. So we've asked our missions starting about a year and a half ago, um, and I know that Dennis Weller, who I'll introduce in a minute, uh, will, will speak to this, Ask our mission to think about, you know, if you could focus on a few things to scale, what would they be? And, and in dialogue with them, we've we really been having a very, very interesting, I think, and revealing set of experiences over the past year. We've had a couple of uh, what we call Glee learning exchange, uh, evidence exchange. We've, we've been working with, uh, with uh, Dr. Lin and also Dr. Richard Cole, sort of how is scaling done across other sectors? Um, who are partners that we might identify? So if Dr. Lin were here, you know, he would want to say a couple of things to, to frame scaling, and then we'll, we'll turn to our panel uh, for a discussion this morning on, on their roles, how they see the main challenges in scaling, how they're working with Feed the Future and in their own organizations to address these big challenges. So if Johannes Lin were here, um, he would be saying, well, first of all, what is scaling? You know, scaling, scaling up is, is simply means more poor farmers, and I would say not just farmers, but others across the value chain, more poor farmers are benefiting from access to and the effective use of agricultural technologies. Um, it's deceptively simple uh, to say it like this, um, but I think we, over the, the history of development intervention, we know that scaling is not like spontaneous diffusion. It doesn't happen on its own. Um, it really involves many different public and private actors and institutions across a very complex value chain. So four elements to really think about, five elements. First, important to have a vision uh, for how widely a successful technology can be adopted. And we've been buttressing this with the agency's readoption of cost-benefit analysis to start really thinking in a more disciplined way, you know, what are those opportunities? How much would they cost? What is the potential impact? So vision. Secondly, to achieve this vision, key actors have to explore and implement scaling up pathways that bring these known technologies to farmers and push forward with replication and adoption even, even well beyond the project's end. Third, identifying drivers, drivers to push the process forward. Who are the champions and what are the incentives, many times business incentives, around this common scaling agenda? 
Um, in whose interest, in whose financial interest will it be uh, to continue uh, whatever financial provision, uh, continue provision of, of agricultural inputs? Fourth, what is the enabling environment? Uh, what's the extension system like? What's the policy system? You know, how will that affect adoption of this technology? And five, how are we effectively learning from our, from our experiences? So we've set this as a frame in our discussions with our, our Feed the Future partners. Uh, Richard Cole, I don't know if he's here today, he's been going out and, and working very much with missions on a sort of hand-to-hand uh, -hand, uh, manner, sort of thinking about their scaling opportunities and thinking with them about what the constraints and opportunities are. And that work is going to continue over the next year as we implement the mission's scaling plans in the Feed the with Feed the Future partners. So let me remove myself to the moderator's chair over here. Great. So I'd now like to introduce, briefly introduce the members of our, our, our panel um, and ask them basically to, to say in five or six minutes uh, what they've been doing in this area. And then uh, get ready with your questions. I think we're, we're, our time is a little bit short this morning. Uh, so get ready with your, your questions. Um, I'm going to start, not in order, sorry about that. Um, I'm going to start with Dr. Pamela Anderson uh, and give her a warm welcome. Uh, she has recently uh, joined the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation as the, the Director of Agricultural Development there. Um, she's the perfect person for this panel because I think of Pamela is now at the Gates Foundation, but she comes from many years of experience at one of the, the most renowned research institu institutions in the world, the CGIR, the Consultative Group for International Agricultural Development. So she was director for 10 years? 10 years, okay, at the International Potato Center in, in Peru. So we're gonna ask her first uh, for her reflections as she has this foot in both worlds, uh, being a, a research director uh, for many years and now coming into the foundation world, how she thinks about scaling. Okay, and then we'll turn to Jane Karuka here on my left. Uh, Jane is the president for the, the Alliance for Green Revolution in, in Africa, known to, I'm sure everybody in this room is, is Agra. Uh, before Agra, uh, she held senior positions with, with private sector companies in agriculture, Farmer's Choice, uh, Cadbury's, the Telcom, uh, Telcom Kenya, um, and she, is, uh, she, has her under, her, she has her degrees in food science and technology and an MBA. Um, and Agra, she's very important, um, of course, for her role in Agra, but Agra is, a, is an important partner for Feed the Future and the, uh, the Alliance for, for Food Security and Nutrition. Uh, Agra is implementing one of our major investments in for scaling seeds and technologies, so she'll speak a little bit about that, okay? And then we have uh, Dr. Tim Krupnik, who is a cropping systems agronomist with another international center, CIMIT, the International Maize and Wheat Improvement Center. Uh, and Tim leads the, the Cereal Systems Initiative for, for Southern Asia, uh, the mechanization and irrigation project. So he's been working with our Southern Asia missions, really focusing on this, this critical issue of local service provision. You know, how do we not just launch a technology but how do we know that, that farmers and users will continue to be able to get this technology? So he's been looking at different models there. He's gonna to talk, to talk to us about that. And Dennis Weller, um, who is our USAID mission director in Ethiopia. He's been mission director there since 2012. Before that, he was in a host of countries, Rwanda, he was in Ghana before that, and many more. Uh, but I've known Dennis for a long time as one of the key champions in the agency for a return to agricultural development food security. So he's been active on that front. We've been grateful for that. So let me turn first and, and, and let Pam Anderson start. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. It's, it's wonderful to be here. Julie did ask me, indeed, in addition to this new hat I'm wearing, to put back the old hat for a minute and share with you reflections as a CG researcher and a director general. So I'm, I'm happy to do that. One of the opening comments I really want to talk about is, is what I would call decompartmentalization and radical collaborations. One of the things that I think our community, our global ag R&D community has suffered from for the past decades is a decompartmentalization. And I felt that very deeply as a research scientist. So, there's a group working on crisis and emergency response, 
a group working on research, a group working on development, and if you tried to reach across those compartments and collaborate, you pretty much got your hand slapped and said, that's not your space, get out. And what was frustrating about that is the opportunities that we were missing. So one of the things that I did anyway was attempt to work across those spaces. The CG centers in general really do work in crisis response, but it's almost a covert body of work. It's not in our strategies. We don't talk about it. We don't plan for it. We don't have budget lines for it, but we do that work. And, and it isn't just for humanitarian reasons. It's because of the business case. This is a way to turn crisis into opportunity and actually do scaling up in that context. About eight years ago, there was a wonderful publication that came out from the CG called Healing Wounds. And it was a documentation of all this work that nobody really knew we were doing. So in, in the case of the International Potato Center, we could talk about Hurricane Mitch, we could talk about severe weather events in Peru, we could talk about the flooding in northern Mozambique, the tsunami, the Sichuan earthquake, the crisis in Timor-Leste, and basically what we were doing in those cases, and very often I was funding this out of my DG contingency money because there was no budget for it, <clears throat> but in Timor-Leste, by bringing in the best germplasm, the most advanced seed technology and training, we literally tripled sweet potato productivity overnight. In Sichuan, in a year, we rehabilitated potato productivity in the whole province. In northern Mozambique, that was the late 90s, it was the first place we got traction with orange flesh sweet potatoes. That is when the introduction started. So it's an incredibly important set of linkages, and I was happy to hear Jada say that one of your breakouts at lunch is to talk about that space. And I think a lot of you in this room, in the missions, are on the front line in the countries. And so how do we make those connections more explicit? How do we plan for them? How do we think about this? It's, it's a very, very, I think, important but not dealt with dimension of scaling up. On the other side, I mean, I was in the room when Minister Shaw gave that speech at IFPRI. It was fabulous, and I think the last thing I did before I left SIP last year was submitted two scaling up proposals because this was new money, new initiative, and it was tremendously welcoming. But before that, I had been working with another potential space for that scaling up, which again, we really weren't supposed to be doing. In 2004, I came to Washington to talk to the World Bank. We had just gone through a targeting exercise, and I knew what our target countries were. And so I asked my friend, Shalki Bargudi to sit down with me and share the World Bank portfolio. What are you investing in in our focus countries? Billions and billions of dollars in agricultural investment, and we weren't even talking to each other. So I didn't get traction on that, but I didn't give up, and eventually I did get traction with IFAD. So in 2011, with that same concept, we launched a program called Food Start. And really the lessons that we learned through these long sets of conversations was researchers didn't know how to talk to bankers. So you've got World Bank, IFAD, Asian and African Development Bank, but it's a very different planning process and cycle. And so what we finally figured out is how could we get our researchers into the missions that were designing these multi-million, if not billion dollar investments, and then use that both to inform them of what we had on the shelf and could get out and get our knowledge into their hands and leverage that investment into the scaling up phase. So that project is on the ground in Asia in five countries, and one of the things at Gates now that we're trying to do with IFAD is see if we can use that model to replicate it. So again, these radical collaborations, I love Johannes's work. I think we do need to get more intentional. I think we also need to think about opportunities and non-traditional ways of working together. That's Joseph. I like that. It's Joseph Sheeran. She, that's a term that she used when she was at the World Food Program, and I loved it. Non-traditional radical collaborations. 
How do we get out of our boxes? And a new hashtag is born. And a new hashtag. Radical is collaborations. Born. Great. Well, thanks for that because I mean a lot of the things that you're that you're talking about really resonate with us here in USAID and Feed the Future, right? A lot of a lot of the partnerships that we're seeing successful, a lot of the things that I think we we're, we we've talked about already in the conference, you know, success and scaling up, have come not because of explicitly directed programs, but because of almost covert work, right? So so your challenge to all of us about how to make that more explicit, you yeah. know, part of our, our guidance and part of our support system, I think is very important. And I'm sure that, that folks out here will have something to say about that. Jane wanted to turn to you next, uh, because, I mean, Agra's been so, so active and, and successful, I think, in thinking about, you know, one of the primary challenges that we have, and that is scaling up seed systems, right? Uh, seed systems and complementary technologies. So with, with, with your, your feet, former feet in the private sector and in, in your, your current position in the foundation world. H how do you see, you know, what are the main opportunities that we have in this sector and, and how can we um, further the cause of, of, of radical collaboration? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Julie. I think that's a lovely new, new line. Um, Agra is pretty, a pretty young organization. We are seven years old. And I think one of our signature programs, like you rightly said, is a seeds program. And the SEEDS program works in four facets you may describe. Capacity building in terms of training scientists in Africa who stay in Africa, so they not tell a whole brain drain, so they can own the research, uh, the research in the right varieties. What I mean right varieties, already the varieties that exist and people consume, so adoption is not a challenge. Uh, the other part that we do is to work with national institutions because for scaling up and for sustainability, this has to be owned mm -hmm. by either the people doing the work themselves or the national governments, because I'm sure you know farmers and, and people trust people they know much better than people flying in to tell them what they should do. Mm -hmm. So that, that's our, the little thing that we're trying to play there. The other one is uh, like, just like in a commercial environment, how do you get that availability of your new research outputs into use into the farmers? And therein lies the challenge of adoption. It's still very, very low. There lies the uh, challenge of distribution. Uh, and and in, in trying to address that, we have developed a distribution network, agro-dealer network. And in terms of the countries we operate, 18 countries now, we have about 15,000. The other thing is ownership of production systems. So we have uh, worked with about 80 seed companies in those countries. And these are entrepreneurs, SMEs in country and who we help in terms of business support services so they can be run well as organizations and they help uh, bridge the gap between the farmer and the national institutions who own this research and this new good technology. Mm -hmm. And what we found is that the, the role of the private sector, this is new bundling entrepreneurial type of private sector in Africa is very important in terms of driving the ownership and also getting acceptance and also helping the capacity building of in-country institutions in terms of how they we sustain this into the future. And then, and then lastly, I think uh, for anything to be scaled up, I think you need to replicate either having many more or increased geographies. And a good partnership we have is with the one you've just described with the G8 Alliance, was we started a partnership last year, which is to help us to get these things to scale because over time we have beautiful and very good examples of how this can work. But unfortunately, there is not enough investment, either from private money or from government, or from NGOs, or from foundations coming in so that we can take this in terms of growth into reasonable sizes so it can start having an effect. So we are grateful we got into partnership with, with your bureau. And with the money that we have, we're trying to grow that partnership to grow in terms of uh, reach more countries. So we've expanded the list of countries where we are operating. We are also trying to get new technologies to support that. And technology, I mean, how does a small seed company process its seed? How does it process its own seed? Uh, how does technology work in terms of uh, knowledge transfer? In terms of how does this good technology get to the farmer? Mm -hmm. 
and, and we, we all know that something like the, the telephone industry is very progressive in Africa. So how do we use our mobile phone? Another one is mechanization. And by the way, we don't have the answers yet to all this, but these are the things that we are thinking about. How do we bring in mechanization, both at production, at farmer level, at the whole distribution process level? Mm -hmm. How do we use technology or knowledge transfer so we can improve adoption? Because I think if we if were even to double the, double the adoption, the scaling up in terms of in-country, people using new varieties and the effect on productivity and therefore going towards solving the food security issue will go a great deal. I think the other challenge we have to think about is sustaining. So it's not just very well working on the seed systems, but how do you work on the whole ecosystem so that you have systemic change in terms of making adoption for a farmer be a very profitable venture. So they are able to keep farming because they're able to sell they improve their productivity, they're able to sell and they're able to get income so they can sort out their other life issues. Uh, and I think uh, lastly is private sector involvement, both in local bundling private sector as well as, the, as well as the big private sector actors. And I think we need to ensure that, that there's an enabling environment in country to attract both, both types of private sector. And sorry, I forgot government role is also very important because government role owns a policy, owns a regulation, owns an enforcement. And unless they do this properly, then this cannot be sustainable. Great, thank you. And so I, I think that was a really nice connection with how, how Pamela started us out. I mean, both with you know, how local ownership is very, very important, right? And so local ownership in terms of local research um, and also looking at local private sector development. Uh, local government involvement, right? And sort of, I think, continuing this theme of it's not, it's not enough just to have great technologies and expect them to disseminate on their own. I mean, I think you all have done such exciting work sort of dissecting, you know, where are the blockages in the system, right? And, you know, I've, I've had the opportunity to hear from some of the folks that, that you helped in the seed sector, right? So hear them tell the story of how difficult it is to get working capital. Uh, to start a seed company or, and sort of some of the innovative things that, that, that you're thinking about in terms of, well, how do, you, how do you help a seed company that's just getting started to have access to seed processing equipment? You know, maybe they'll never have enough money for, you know, the next year or two to buy their equipment. Could they share this equipment? You know, how can they be given an assist to get capital uh, that, they, that, they, that they can work with in the interim? So I think this is, this is great, the reminder of it all starts with local and local ownership and local local proof of technology and taking the systems concept. So I think again we've got another great segue uh, to to Tim Tim's work uh, with with CISA. Um, and Tim, you've got a, a video and a presentation. Okay. Ooh, sorry. Re remote control. Indeed, as they were saying yesterday, it is difficult to get the green button to respond. Push hard. Try one more. Okay, no response. Well, that's fine. Actually, I think I can do this without the presentation. Oh, we do have, okay. Yeah, I'm not to... seeing on the prompter up here. Yeah. Okay, excellent, excellent, excellent. Do you want to move to the podium? Maybe? No, it's fine, I can do it from here. Thanks. Um, so I'm here to talk a little bit about the Serial Systems Initiative for South Asia, which is actually, I think Pamela has a great term, this radical collaboration. It's a collaboration between um, Simit, Eri, World Fish in Bangladesh, and it's also uh, more broadly funded by the Gates Foundation in partnership with USAID, working also in Nepal and in India. And, um, Part of the radical collaboration that we've developed is bringing on another partner, which is International Development Enterprises. It's a Denver-based NGO to help us with some of our scaling up work. And in Bangladesh, we're working in the Feed the Future zone. And Bangladesh is an interesting country, if you haven't been. It's the size of Wisconsin, and we pack 165 million people into that country. But at the same time, farmers in the Feed the Future zone 
are facing labor scarcity at peak times, namely planting and at harvesting, and that's increased production costs that poor farmers face. Also, at the same time, there's a lack of, of irrigation facilities despite an abundance of surface water, which could be used for irrigation. And this has resulted in low crop intensity with roughly 50% of the farmers in this area growing only one rain-fed rice crop per year, while there's an enormous opportunity during the dry season as well. So the work that we've done and the research that we've focused on at CIMIT over the years has been based at looking at small-scale mechanization. And in Bangladesh, there's roughly 450,000 two-wheel tractors already in the country that farmers are using for plowing services. And they've been there for roughly 20 odd years. What we're doing that's differently is trying to develop technologies that can graft onto that model already. So we're, our engineers and our agronomists have worked for many years through research to, to develop essentially plug and play attachments that can go on the back of the two wheel tractors. And that material and those equipments allow you to have precision seeding and fertilizing at the same time as preparing land. By removing the tines on the equipment, it's compatible with conservation agriculture. By definition, it's a climate smart approach to production. These can lower production costs for farmers. And most importantly, the engines that are on these two wheel tractors can be used to drive irrigation pumps. And we're doing a lot of work on axial flow pumps, which is a smart surface water irrigation pump that we've been developing that at low lifts give you roughly 50% more fuel efficiency per unit of water delivered. That's the technology, but it's my job basically to figure out how to translate that into action and see adoption occur. And that's where it gets interesting because what I want to stress is it's not solely about the technology alone. The technologies will not drive themselves. So we're looking at systems to see them being deployed. Most projects would simply procure equipment from an importer of machinery or a manufacturer and asset transfer them to the farmer. This is a quick way to meet your targets, but is not necessarily sustainable in the long run. So what we've been aiming at are new models where we're looking at value chains and working with machinery manufacturers and importers who have large dealer networks that we work intensively with, who can sell these machineries through a number of mechanisms that we've developed to local service providers. And local service providers are small scale, rural entrepreneurs who have the capability to meet farmers' needs and to utilize the machines for preparing land and for planting at a scale that we can't reach through a project alone. And our job is to facilitate that process. So what does that actually look like in practice? There's a short video I'd like to have played that shows you what uh, service provision for bed planting practices look like using this equipment. With bed planting, rapidly rotating blades first till the soil. The soil is then reshaped into long beds that alternate with furrows. When driving the bed planter, the plates in the seed box rotate as the machine moves forward. Each hole in the plate carries one seed that is dropped through a tube into a slit made in the bed. As with strip tillage, fertilizer can be applied at the same time by the machine. Mr. Ashraf, the local service provider, has for many years tilled farmers' fields with his power tiller. Bed planting helped him save fuel costs and serve more clients. The bed planter has many advantages, as we can do all in one turn. While previously the farmer spent 1,000 dhaka, we can now do it for 400 dhaka. So here he has a 600 dhaka saving. For this reason, I have been able to inspire farmers to have it done this way. You know, the farmers benefited and I have benefited too. In my business, both parties have benefited. So that's the, the, the premise of local service provision and how we see it as a promising mechanism to reach farmers. But it's only one part of the puzzle. For us, another problem that we faced was actually scaling up the availability of the machinery itself. And so we're working to play a temporary but catalytic role in market systems development. And this is where the CGIR's partnership with IDE on this work, I think, is a radical collaboration that's important. We've done a, a number of pieces of research where we judged the market size and the extent to which these machineries can be utilized. And armed with that information, we approached two large private sector firms that are working on agricultural machineries in Bangladesh. 
and they were interested to partner with us because we actually could speak business logic to them. We approached them with core business ideas about how much money could be made in this market and worked with them to link the dealers to local service providers to see that this is scaled up. And we think that we're on track. At this point in time, in the first six months of the project, and we are still yes, less than one year old, we are able to leverage $650,000 of private sector investment where these firms put their own money on the table for the manufacturing of this equipment with our technical backstopping, for the advertising and sales of this equipment to service providers. And we've seen that that's worked. In the first year, roughly 200 service providers have serviced over 7,000 farmers in the Feed the Future zone. So we're building this enabling environment that's been spoken about a lot to get research from, from the lab, as, as was said, to scale and ideally to a system that will be sustainable. But a last point that is important, and I think this is something also to talk about on this, this panel, in scaling projects, you never know what's actually going to come down the road when you start. And you have to be nimble. You have to be able to respond to new opportunities. Problems will arise, and you need to find ways around them. And I think that research and researchers are especially well-equipped to be able to do this because we're trained to have a broader vision and to understand systems and understand if we pull on one lever, what might happen in another sector. So that's an important point to drive home in scaling projects. That was you. fascinating. I'm, I'm going to take moderator's prerogative and just follow up with a quick question to mm -hmm. you. So, I mean, this is a, a, a radical project for a CG system to undertake. So, I mean, what was, you know, how did this come about? Can you tell us a little bit, bit about how CIMIT, you know, started to work on, on CISA, you know, with us? And, you know, what, what led to the sort of, sorry to ask you to do this in just a minute <laughs> before we turn to Dennis, but, you know, what was this, this shift of, of, of mindset, I think, that, that sort of welcomed this opportunity to, to partner in a different way to make sure technologies got out the door? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, the CISA program actually began in 2009 in, in, in the four countries of South Asia, again with Gates and USAID support. And the investments in Bangladesh were made by the mission to expand those efforts. And I think that the, the approach came from a realization that research can't sit on a shelf. And, the two-wheel tractors that I've spoken about in this equipment has been worked on by CIMIT for a number of years. Mm -hmm. And we found that you can't just keep planting demonstrations and research trials and working with lead farmers and expect the technologies to somehow magically persist. Mm -hmm. right? So CISA has embraced a market systems approach, and we've had very good backing and support to do that. But it, again, is through the strategic partnership that I think that we have with IDE that has allowed us to really leverage this approach, because as, as you mentioned, in terms of researchers not knowing how to talk to banks, researchers also don't always know that well how to speak to the private sector. You, so you need strategic partners who can assist you through that process in getting the, the products of research actually into the field. Thanks, thanks, very exciting. Great, so, so last but not least, um, I'd like to turn to Dennis, uh, our mission director from Ethiopia, and I think there's, a, there's a, a lot of stories that you could tell about radical collaborations um, and how USAID, Ethiopia, and the Feed the Future program there is really thinking about this, this scaling up opportunity and, and who you're partnering with uh, to think through those opportunities. So over to you. Thanks, Julie. I'm not sure I want to call it radical collaboration. I'm not sure how much that hashtag radical in a newspaper in Ethiopia might not do me so well. And I don't think we have an elephant in the road here either, so I think we'll kind of bridge <laughs> something. Yeah, that could be arranged. <laughs> um, I'd like to talk a little bit about kind of the way we've actually looked at scaling in, in Ethiopia, and in, particularly in an institution that we've worked closely with and that's actually done, done a lot for, for scaling up agriculture technologies, and that's the Agriculture Transformation Agency. Uh, Raj Shah talked about that during the plenary in the first day, uh, about a delivery unit that's actually to take some of this research technology, other technology, and kind of scale it up and, and kind of move it out to, to farmers in a, a more deliberate and a, and a much more perhaps radical way. Um, ATA, Agriculture Transformations Agency, set up a couple years ago, 2011, and after a 18-month diagnostic looking at agriculture, the prime minister said, you know, we got to get agriculture moving better. How do we do it? A consulting firm come in, kind of peeled away the layers and, and looked at what the constraints were to agriculture moving much more quickly. And the f 
a good extension system, uh, a reasonably good research system in the Ministry of Agriculture, but just couldn't get it all together. So saw something called a, a delivery unit, this transformation agency. It's not really, it's a quasi-government agency, but it's got a couple of different characteristics to it. It's not on the government pay scale, so they can attract talent from all over the world, and they have, in fact. They've brought a lot of the diaspora back who's, who's worked in, in international settings. Uh, they bring, bring students back who are, are basically been management consultants. They're on their way to getting their MBAs, and that gap between the, their consulting period and the MBA, they, they, they come and, and, and work for the ATA. Uh, and it reports directly to the prime minister, another kind of critical, I think, piece of how you take it out of the regular uh, trajectory of, of government bureaucracies to actually get technology out there. Um, so I, I, that, that has really helped, I, I think, move agriculture. And what they don't do is they're, they're not an implementer, another NGO out there. They're not out there implementing on their own. They are that collaborator. They are the ones who are basically being catalytic and, and bringing together the Ministry of Agriculture the research, NGOs, the private sector, donors, uh, to, to really be, uh, bring, bring a problem to, uh, t together and, and being able to, to uh, deliver on, on a certain problem. I'll give you a couple examples. One is soil mapping. Um, um, and, and we've, again, had a real push in the Ministry of Agriculture to, to do soil mapping. ATA came in and was able to kind of take that much more to scale, able to get 10,000 samples, soil samples, and really help map the country in, in a grid-based, GIS-based, so you've got uh, a much better platform on which to make recommendations for crops, for fertilizer, soil conservation efforts, and that sort of thing. An important kind of precondition to kind of doing something in agriculture, but then we kind of combine that with now uh, uh, a, fer a blended fertilizer. Normally we've had just the regular DAP and the urea. Okay, we, we know what that is, we know what that'll do, but that standard recommendation throughout the country for all crops you know, wasn't terribly helpful. But having a, a blended fertilizer, bringing some micronutrients in, and having this soil mapping already there, GIS-based mapping, to let farmers know what they could apply, where, and what crops is actually, and we're just starting that now. So that's the first blending uh, plant's going to be inaugurated in a couple weeks. And so having kind of that public good out there, that soil mapping grid, and then cooperatives coming in with this blended fertilizer and working with the private sector to actually get this blended fertilizer out there, the right kind of fertilizer and the right crops, is going to, it could increase that we reckon anywhere up to seven, up to 30, I think 35% uh, increase in, in ag productivity. The other, another example is, and perhaps one that's actually been tried and true and really is, has scaled up, is on teff. Teff is a, a, a crop in a very unique to Ethiopia. It's, it's about the size of a sesame seed, a bit bigger than that. Uh, but it's a staple food for the, 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 the population in, in injera, which is a kind of pancake-like bread that, uh, that the most Ethiopians eat. Um, and if you go to any Ethiopian restaurant here in, in Washington, and there's a lot of them, you can find it here as well. But TEF, fairly low production, or low yields, low productivity, hadn't really seen any kind of increases uh, uh, in, in some time. And it had been planted this, the same way for centuries. Go out there with a bunch of seed and start broadcasting it. So the population was uneven, overpopulated, that would grow and that would, you know, be not enough fertilizer. It, too heavily populated, it would fall over, it would lodge, and then you lose a lot of that seed because uh, it's so small you can't pick it up. So looking at kind of what we would do as we dissected the problem, simple technology of row planting was, was kind of struck on. So what that would do, we did a few varied trials with the ag research system there, saw that that could actually increase yields 70%. If you got out there just simply used half a third as much seed, not the heavy populations, plant it in rows, and basically you could see a, a, a real increase in, 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 in productivity. Started out soon after ATA began in 2011 with 1,500 farmers. Two years later, it's up to 1,500,000 farmers. So you can see that real scale up of a fairly simple technology 
I say it's simple, just planting in rows sounds simple, but actually bringing in all that together, figuring out the, the plant, getting the, 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 the row planters and getting private sector involved in making those not so easy to do in a country where you don't have a, a vibrant private sector and you've got some, some risk aversion. Well, if I, if I manufacture these, is anybody going to buy them? Well, fortunately, after from 1,500 to 1,500, you saw, saw a real market for those, those happening. Um, so I, I think that's, you know, a, a couple examples. We're looking at ATA, the Ag Transformations Agency, scaling up other technologies uh, uh, in, for under Feed the Future. And this is commercial farm centers where you actually get private sector much more involved. They've, they've got a public-private partnership uh, a unit. They brought somebody, uh, uh, another Ethiopian diaspora, back from Citibank to kind of head this up and to, to strike partnerships with, with, with PepsiCo, with with, the, the, with, with uh, DuPont Pioneer and with the South African firms to really look at agricultural processing and agricultural productivity. It's not without, without its challenges, how you take this and kind of sustain it over time, because right now it's pretty much 100% donor funded. Mm -hmm. uh, how you get this incorporated into regular mechanics of, of the government uh, and still have its vibrancy uh, to it uh, is, is, is a challenge. Bringing kind of, we, we were wanting to kind of bring people with the Ministry of Agriculture into that eventually and, and gradually kind of then turn it over to the Ministry of Agriculture. I think that, that kind, of, uh, kind of crossover has not yet happened. Uh, it has been slow to start. It's not according to the plan. So I think you find some, some challenges with these delivery units, but what we're finding is taking technology and able to be able to kind of scale it up and through this fairly unique uh, parastatal being able to deliver on, on scaled up technology to millions of farmers. We leave it there. I was thinking a couple of things across the panel. Um, local ownership, right, is it doesn't mean necessarily doing things the same old way, mm -hmm. right? And some of the things that we're seeing with, with ATA, that you mentioned bringing in diaspora experts, mm -hmm. training students, bringing them in, is really helping, you know, I think change the perspective, you know, of a, a number of different public and private institutions and helping to unlock a lot of processes. So, you know, Tim, you talked about uh, the two-wheeled tractor that's not new, you know, and also the TEF row planting is, is not new, right? Mm -hmm. That's technology that's been, but it's been on the shelf. So it, it needed this infusion of energy, you know, and then thinking about creatively how to work with the, the extension system mm -hmm. in, in Ethiopia, uh, you know, which is possibly the strongest extension system mm -hmm. in, in, in Africa. 60,000 um, strong there, and it's yeah. very effective in getting this yeah, technology so, out. Yeah, so an instant way to demonstrate a technology you know, and Tim, you talked about sort of the, the unusual uh, using agribusiness dealers and in, in, in Agra as well. So sort of unusual, okay, I won't call them radical, unusual collaborations, right? Unusual and radical collaborations both, right? To sort of unlock uh, sitting potential. So, so that, that, that came up. And then, you know, as you were speaking, Dennis, I was also thinking about, um, you know, how much of public good is still so important across everything that we've talked about today. You know, it's really not a matter of we can turn it all over to the private sector because, you know, if we did that, we wouldn't have the, you know, the, 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 the history of research that developed the technology, that developed the tractors, that developed the, the TEF road planting, that developed XYZ. You wouldn't have sort of that public good aspect that helps to smooth the transition to the private sector. So I think, you know, especially as we're talking about uh, technology scaling, it's important to keep in mind that that public good aspect is critical, um, but we are capable of thinking of, of, of different ways of, of unlocking uh, the power and energy of that public investment. Yes? Can I comment, to comment on that very briefly? Um, I think that's, that's a very important point because in this conference I've, I've met with a number of people who are from the private sector and the thing that I've heard repeatedly is that they need the public sector, and they need this research, and they need this information. And we've experienced that in Bangladesh, too. And I think one of the things that smoothed our ability, to use your words, in getting the private sector co to cooperate with us was that we could link them with research and that we came with strong, unbiased data mm -hmm. about the performance of the machines, about the assessment of markets and the availability of service providers. Um, and more importantly, in, in Bangladesh, for example, it's a, it's a risky environment for innovation amongst companies. There's no patent laws. 
um, there's not a lot of incentive for the private sector to develop something new on their own because there's a high risk that it's just going to get copied very quickly by a competitor. And so in that respect, the value that was added by working with us, and we work also very closely with the, the Bangladesh Agricultural Research Institute, one of our national partners, who really, I think, in terms of the video that I showed with bed planters, was primarily responsible for the developing the base of this technology and working on it over time, um, being able to link the private sector with the public sector in a way that shared that information to enable scaling, I think has been a critically important part of developing an environment that enables this kind of work to be done. CGIR institutes, I think, are very well placed to do that kind of brokering work because we are international research centers and can speak that language across these two groups. So, so I think that's an important point to drive home in terms of the value that we can add to this process. Thanks, and I also liked your previous point of you know, it's not necessarily the CG center that has to do all this itself. You mm -hmm. know, the really important thing is the brokerage and identifying partners on the outside. I, exactly. You know, I've had a number of conversations over the years with, with researchers telling me, well, I can help to do this, but first I need to train myself to be a seed technologist, or I need to train myself in seed processing and marketing, and that's going to take a few years. So, you know, that's not the idea. The mm -hmm. idea is, you know, who out there has these skills and abilities and finance and partner partner with them. So thanks very much. So I'd, I'd love to turn it over to the audience for, for your questions and, and answers from our, 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 for our panelists. We have microphones. It's really hard to see up here, so you probably have to yeah. jump up and, okay. And, can, and please could I ask you to, to introduce yourselves and let's take, uh, let's take several questions and then we'll, we'll come back to the panel. Hi, uh, my name is Todd Crosby. I'm the chief of party for the Agenda Project in Senegal. And I'd just like to uh, address what Tim was saying. We're also, the centerpiece of our project is also the service provider. We call them solution providers. And we have hundreds of them in Senegal now. And they were based on the model uh, developed in the Profit Project in Zambia. And we really find that that that's really the nexus of everything that the panel is talking about. Getting the private sector involved. We have about 35 different companies working with these providers. And pulling the um, technologies out of the C CG centers. Uh, we've, we've done biofortified sweet potato. We've done millet, biofortified millet through these service providers. We have also... Um, We've done a lot of uh, tillage service provision. One thing that we are finding is going to help us, we hope, take it to the next level is the use of the package and really free up some um, capital from the, the banks and the use of agricultural insurance in these packages. And so I was just going to you know, make that suggestion to look at those packages and <laughs> allow them, you know, that, that, that's something that, you know, the banks seem to be much more open to financing farmers if, if they're protected by agricultural insurance in a package. Great. Thanks for that comment. Another question? Yes, right here in the center. Thanks, Todd. Uh, thank you, Julie. Uh, my name is Howard. I'm with USAID in Rwanda. And I appreciate the comments from the entire panel, but perhaps would like to direct my question to Dr. Anderson. I like your idea of collaborating with the multilateral lending institutions, but because of the fact that they tend to channel their funds through the national governments, and the national governments traditionally put very little of their funds towards agricultural research and extension services, I just wondered, what is your experience with working with the National Agricultural Research Institutes, the Agricultural Extension Services? Because I think these are a very important part of that equation of local ownership uh, in, in extension research and also in scaling up. Thank you. Thanks. 
Okay, another question, a couple of questions back there. Uh, my name is Richard Cole. I'm a scaling up consultant uh, working with PFS. Um, Tim, you were uh, very uh, tantalizing there with your elephant picture. Uh, I'd like to hear more a little bit about what the obstacles that you've uh, faced. In particular, you alluded to the fact that things don't always go to plan, yet in a lot of our project implementation and scaling strategies, we have our results frameworks, we have our script that we follow about the activities and the intermediate results, but you seem to be implying that things don't always go according to the script. Can you talk about how, when you're trying to scale, especially when you're scaling in a partnership where you don't control, obviously, what the partners are necessarily going to do, how, how is that different from following your logical framework, your results framework, and your activities? And how do you, uh, and, and what do you think might be the implications, not just for your project, but for other projects that are going to use more of this collaborative, uh, facilitative approach? And maybe, uh, Mr. Weller, you could comment on that too, because it sounds like you also were very uh, opportunistic and proactive in sort of figuring out uh, different strategies as the opportunities arose. Uh, thank you. Okay, so, so let's go back to the panel at this point. So, so we suggestion on, on the importance of packages and uh, financing for, for banks, uh, comment on that, uh, collaboration with multilateral and strengthening national research and extension. I think that was directed to you, Pam, but perhaps others will have comments as well. Um, and then what, what are your elephants, Tim? <laughs> <laughs> I have five or six of them. <laughs> um, I'm actually going to address two of the points that were made in, in reverse order, starting sort of with Richard's comment. Um, unintended consequences and things that happen that are unexpected, I think, are common. Um, we found in the case of the axial flow pump, which again is this fuel efficient irrigation pump that we've been working on, um, our initial goal, and again, mind you, I work for the International Maize and Wheat Improvement Center, our initial goal was to see that this was a technology that could be deployed to bring irrigation to farmers who, during the dry season, were unable to grow a crop because of soil moisture stress. We were really interested in this particular aspect of sustainable intensification, and we remain interested in it. But what we found in the first year is that there was a great interest in the pumps in other sectors. Um, the first one, for example, and most of the interest was for dry season irrigated rice production. And we saw that a lot of the pumps went to replacing less efficient pumps on lands that were already irrigated um, in the order of thousands of hectares. Now, at first I got nervous about this because I have an institutional mandate to follow, but yet the outcome of this is actually very, very beneficial. Again, imagine on all of the lands in the south of Bangladesh where dry season rice is being produced, if the current pumps that are being used are replaced with a pump that is up to 50% more fuel efficient. What does that mean for lowering production costs for farmers? More importantly, what could that offer in terms of a reduction in the carbon footprint of rice production? So that was one surprise that came up. Um, another point, and we're starting to work with the Feed the Future Aquaculture Project, which is also led by World Fish and was represented at this forum, on seeing that the pumps can be deployed for fish hatcheries, where there's an interest in being able to move water from pond to pond. And the private sector is particularly interested in that because they see quick and easy markets there. It's clearly more difficult to work with the private sector and say, no, no, you have to sell your pumps only in this area where we have the poorest of the farmers and the market is the most difficult point to reach. So what we've done instead of sort of rejecting this unintended consequence is actually embrace it. And we're working with these companies to see that they deploy this equipment wherever it is most profitable for them. And again, in these two sectors, there's already great benefit environmentally, agriculturally, of having done so. But we're also working much more intensively in our specific areas of interest where we've identified lands that we want to see intensified during the dry season, where we want farmers who do not currently grow a crop get into a crop with the help of this irrigation. And that's where the question that came from Senegal was important because, again, it's not just the technology that can move this, and it's not just the presence of the private sector and a bit of a market that's working. In those environments where things are much more difficult, we're refocusing our strategy in the second year of the project to layer on access to finance so farmers can procure inputs in these areas, to doing more intensive demonstration work in the first part of uh, 
this intensification process to get awareness raised about how you can use these techniques and still avoid risk, um, and to layer in a number of sort of more livelihood-oriented interventions on top of the market-based interventions in these specific areas. Yet at the same time, we embrace the broader, um, the broader consequences of what has occurred, which I think is a positive thing. So I think those are two of my elephants, at Great. least. Thank you, thank you. Any other comments on sort of uh, the, kind of the flip side of, of, uh, of, of, of rogue partnerships or uh, self partnerships is unintended consequences. So, you know, any any comments from the rest of you? I mean, on, on how we, as organizations, to sort of recognize that and uh, re reward it. I guess within within bounds. Dennis. Yeah. Well, I, I think that a, a couple things, and I talked about the TEF example, and you know, just. It, it, there's so many moving parts to something like this and getting to work, certainly working, as you said, Julie, with the 60,000 extension agents out there that are so effective in getting that technology out. And if you've got some weak links there, that doesn't work. This worked in our case, or, or certainly working with government, working with the banks. And then get the private sector, that just didn't work out so well getting these row planters out there. So we kind of resorted to just kind of planning this up by hand, in these, but still in rows, and kind of learning how to populate it in a way that was, was spaced properly. So. I mean, there's certain ways of adapting. I, I might say the, the one big challenge, and the elephant perhaps, uh, that we've got is because this ATA is technically outside of government, even though it reports to the prime minister, it really doesn't have some of the big, isn't part of the big policy making mm -hmm. uh, discussions that go on in government because it is outside. And that's where I think we've got to, you know, where, where a lot of the changes have to happen on the policy side. We've a new alliance for food security and, and, and nutrition. Uh, Ethiopia is one of the countries, and there's a 16-point policy matrix there. It's been very slow to move off the mark. We've tried to enlist ATA, but they frankly just don't have the, the kind of the connectivity with, with kind of the inner, make, inner, inner circle of, of, of policy making there, with the exception of SEED. Mm -hmm. SEED was one of the first ones we had uh, that, that really has kind of helped open up that space, particularly to the private sector and to uh, uh, a, a, a seed seed sector that now is, I think, uh, expanding more, more and more. So, but that's one of the elephants we see is just that lack of access to policymaking. Great, thank you. So, Pamela, would you like to talk about? I mean, so this theme that, that, that Dennis is raising. I mean, sort of, you know, access to policymakers and collaboration among uh, among donors uh, with government is important to address uh, persistent policy issues. I think this also comes up in the course in the seed area, and Jane may want to comment on that, but. And would you like to respond to the? Yeah, a, a little bit more generally. Y your question is so important. And I think this is a flip in the attitude that we're all walking through. I mean, how do we live country owned, country led? I mean, it, it's really non trivial. And I think what we're trying to do is really a much, much better job. This is starting in the CG, uh, certainly at the foundation. Th this is something we're working very hard on. How do we really understand what the priorities of the governments are? You know, it's, it's not a discussion anymore about our goals and our intentions. What are their goals and their intentions, and how do we get behind them and make them successful? And Rwanda is an excellent case. You know, Agnes Kalibata has a clear vision and very, very ambitious goals. Um, last year, I picked up the telephone to her because as we were studying the CATA plans, she, Rwanda was one of the countries that basically said, we want to prioritize potatoes. And it was very simply, what can we do to help you? And can we go in together and write up a proposal to the GAFSP, for example? You have to take the lead, but is there a way that we can support you in that? And so really understanding what the countries are putting out is their intentions. We had Akin Adesina at the foundation with us a couple weeks ago for three days. And it, it, was, it was inspiring, uh, linking back to your point on packages, what they have done by getting the e-wallet into the hands of 15 million smallholder farmers has literally, in the course of two and a half to three years, tripled to quintupled productivity in some of the staple crops. And so, you know, understanding what that vision is, what they're doing, how we become collaborators and supporters pulling the different sources we have to, to basically help countries be successful with their own ambitions and plans. Great. 
Any, any comment on national research and extension systems that? Well, and, and so that becomes part of it. I mean, okay. so, so we have been very involved in, obviously, in the ATA work. Um, that model, it really was being, it was a request of the president to set this up, and it's become a model. Tanzania is asking for it, Nigeria is asking for it. Mm -hmm. so, so looking at these investments as models, how do we rebuild the extension services that have been unraveled over the last decades? You know, how do we actually do capacity building? I think AID is doing a wonderful job. We are trying to also really get serious about rebuilding that next generation of young researchers mm -hmm. in country. Um, one of the most inspiring cases is AGRA. Joe DeVries in the audience. I mean, what we have managed to do to actually build an entire generation of breeders for Africa, I mean, that would have been a dream 20 years ago. So I mean, there, there's good work going on and we can't take our foot off the gas pedal. Thank you. Jane? Yeah, so I think my point of view is that for everybody along that chain has to be a partner. Mm -hmm. You have to treat the government as your partner, uh, the research centers, CIMIT and others as, as a partner, the foundations as a partner. I think Agra, we are a perfect partnership we were formed as a partnership between Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and Rockefeller Foundation. And once you define those partners as, as your partners to get to the next level of scaling up, then you not, must ensure that your visions are aligned. Mm -hmm. Because I think the reason you get unintended consequences sometimes, you go into the partnership and the, there is no alignment in terms of what mm -hmm. you all want to achieve. So I think it's very important uh, to ensure that is done. I think one of the most successful thing we have done in partnership with the government is actually access to finance, which is a very big challenge in the whole of this uh, scaling up issue with the government of Kenya, government of uh, Uganda and, and Mozambique and Ghana. Mm -hmm. And we worked government, private sector, IFAD and AGRA. Just de-risking financial incentive mm -hmm. uh, from private sector banks to lend to the smallholder farmers and the outcome of, of that work is that smallholder farmers do not actually default. Hmm. Me and you may have a challenge, but the farmers actually do not default. And Kenya government now has scaled that up, has owned it in its budgetary process, and it's dedicating each year a good amount of money, like $30 million, just for that sector. Hmm. And we're hoping to get inroads in the other kind of governments. But what happened, from my experience, the government really wanted it because it's in line with their vision. The partners really wanted to do that. There was a lot of capacity building to make sure that this partnership works in terms of everybody honoring what their side of the commitments were. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and somebody, of course, provided the finance. So there has also to be the public good in terms of the initial investment to break the cycle. Mm -hmm. So I think we all need each other. The most important thing is that how is the different organization, the different partners, what is their role? And is it clear for them? And what are the expectations? Thanks. I'm, I'm seeing the beginning of another hashtag, and it's around de-risking. Yeah, de-risking to unlock investment. OK, great. I think we have time for another round of, of, of questions. OK, so we, I see Mark Carrado there, and then another one over here. OK, you could have the microphones. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to put on my hat of representing the three regional organizations, uh, ECOWAS, UMWA, and SEALS. And I have listened uh, uh, very carefully to the need to strengthen, develop and strengthen, and implement partnership in this new uh, big movement. So I am just happy to tell you that I'm going to take away from this, going back to the region, with a lot of enthusiasm, and I'll sit down with my colleagues from ECOWAS and UMWA. I'll uh, try to interpret uh, um, to the extent I possibly can, and if I cannot do a good job, USAID West and Regional uh, is going to be there with us discussing these uh, larger issues. But I want to bring to the floor that the region is really uh, very excited about these new developments and uh, political leadership by uh, ECOWAS and uh, UMWA and the technical leadership by SILS are, are quite poised and fully understand uh, the challenges and the opportunities this big movement is creating. And I just want to assure you that uh, 
we are ready. A lot of lights are shining on that region, at least on the 17 countries that make up UMOA, uh, ECOWAS, and SILS. And uh, we cannot uh, be happier to be part of this big movement. And I assure you that if things don't work on the uh, political level, please do not hesitate to contact us because there are political uh, 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 networks that are there to just deal with that. And if things don't work on the uh, public sector area, uh, technical matters related to resilience, uh, climate change, and so on and so forth, uh, you have the SILS and the ECOWAS and UMA, and you have the CORAFs and others. So basically, I just want to make sure that you guys get the message. We got it. And then we're going to play our part to make sure that the uh, population targeted for to benefit from this uh, uh, big movement will certainly be happy to know that we are on board and then things should change. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Another question over here? Morning, Mark Corrado from USAID uh, Kenya, uh, previously of USAID Ethiopia, working closely with Dennis. Um, just a quick comment and an open-ended question, I think. Um, I think uh, working previously in Afghanistan as well and now in Kenya and seeing the same problem in different countries in terms of scaling up technology and how that works, what I think makes the ATA so impressive and I think has such potential is three main factors, just to reemphasize. One of which is, I think, the fact that they're problem-focused and not process-focused made all the difference in the world. So they came at it from a, 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 a viewpoint of what are the issues, and then let's build a process and metrics and everything around the problem, and not just say let's have a group and have a working group and know we're in charge of something and, and try to figure out how we fit in. That, that might be subtle, but I think it was absolutely imperative to the success they've had. Secondly, I think the fact that they prioritized so, so ardently, then they really do say no to things, uh, also uh, I think is very important. And it forced us as AID to negotiate our partnership with them in a different way. So the way we directly fund them, the way we work with them on the DuPart partnership and PepsiCo, the way we use them in the new alliance process to draft the new alliance with the government of Ethiopia, I think was uh, much more advantageous based on the way they were, they were, um, they were uh, set up. So now in Kenya and in, in other places, I, I guess the question then is where you don't have that kind of mandate, where you don't have a, a laser focused organization that's problem that has the ability to get really great metrics, by the way, they, they, they have, Capacity is not an issue with the ATA in terms of how they can get together details and information and so forth. How do we try to foster that with our government counterparts that are usually spread across a whole litany of research institutions, policymakers, and then in the case of Kenya now with devolution and a new constitution, a complete array of local decision makers at a county level that need to be involved. How do we build those? How do we make a process as a chance to succeed and not just get bogged down under its, under its own weight? We have one more question and then we'll come, go back to the panel. Okay, sorry. Okay. Thank you. Jose Garcia from Guatemala, the Extension Director for the Ministry of Agriculture. Well, I have two comments. One related to the potato uh, crop. Um, since I, I was 30 years in Honduras, now that I'm back in my country as, as the Extension Director, I was amazed that, amazed that uh, in the highlands of Guatemala, um, uh, ICTA, which is our local um, uh, research institute, for 16 years they brought a variety to the highlands of Guatemala 16 years ago. Now, uh, after that, they have a nematode problem that has reduced production up to 20%. Now it's only 20% than before it was 100. So I am, I am very concerned that how our local research institutions should be taken into account to, so, to support them and to cope with local problems such as this one that I'm talking about. The second one is related to, to maize, corn. Again, uh, we are talking about scaling up uh, new, new uh, hybrids that has, poten that has uh, uh, protection for, like, in this case, uh, uh, an insect, you know, love, the famous, the one that, that, uh, that has to do with corn. Uh, uh, but that problem has been resolved. And, and of course, th that a, new, a new variety, that new hybrid is being used in the, in the areas where you know, we have a lot of corn, but we have a lot of corn that is local varieties. 
uh, that are, are being produced in the, in, in the hills of Guatemala, and that the people want to keep those varieties because many reasons, you know, uh, taste, uh, they even prepare different foods with different varieties, black and, and, and brown and, and, and everything. But how we, we kind of deal with the local varieties, especially maize, corn that is, 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 is located, is considered as the, the Mayan culture as the, as the center of, of that. So please uh, help us to cope with those, both things, because we want to, of course, take into account the new varieties that's, which are resolving problems with us, pests and, and, and you know, draw resistance and everything. But we also want to, to help our local small farmers there at the highlands to keep their varieties, that they have their own reasons why they want to keep them. Thanks. Thank you very much. So I think we'll, we'll quickly go back to the, the panel. We had a, a, a comment um, and question, I think, about the role of regional institutions. And you know, maybe, Jane, you'd like to talk about the Scaling Seeds Partnership and sort of the role that we're, you're seeing right, with, with regional policy and making sure that, that variety information is getting out, working closely with, with Comesa. Um, question about, the, I think, the role of extension uh, services, right? So, and I, it was, it's interesting, I was, I was remembering uh, a Minister Paz's uh, remarks on the, the first day of the conference about how in Honduras, you know, everybody must grow maize and beans, but they don't have to grow it the same, same way. They can grow it much more productively, so diversify and, and increase their incomes that way. And then the, the, the question about what do you do when there's no ATA? Okay, quickly, and then I think we'll have to transition. Last, last comments, last wrap of comments, because Congressman McGovern is here. Okay, I can go first. Mm -hmm. I think the question of regional policies and uh, processes is very important, and I think we are seeing very good traction between whether you're in ECOWAS, EAC, COMESA, and all the other regional bodies we have, because the world is becoming a much smaller place, and, and as in Africa, have to start talking with our neighbors, because one day you'll have Tanzania growing more maize than and Kenya is having an issue, there has to be allowable free trade movements. And I think we are making progress at TSC level, at ECOWAS, I say we are really appreciating, and I think this is going to help the scaling up issues better because we are opening ourselves to our own bigger markets, to our own bigger access to technologies and things that work, and sharing openly. So I think we are seeing very good traction there. I think in terms of its year model, I think it's a very good model in terms of just centralizing the decisions, prioritizing that you have described. But it's a challenge as you move to different countries because different countries have different governance structures. So the challenge we have is how do we take the ATA model and sell it to the other governments? I think we shouldn't assume that they know what goes on. And I think we need probably to advocate more. And we should not underestimate the convening power in this room. There's a lot of convening power that USAID, for example, in country can talk to a certain country leadership in terms of uh, showing them the best model of this. And between us, and the b between us, the foundations, the bilaterals, people in this room, I think we can really have uh, an effect. Even having Agnes, for example, talk to her counterparts in the other country, mm -hmm. I think it would really, it would really work. Thank you. Yeah. Pam? Um, indirectly, the indirect answer to your, to your potato question. I mean, a lot of what we're doing and talking about is taking global public goods and scaling those out and up. There are local problems, and there are local problems that we're not addressing because they don't come up high enough on the global priority list, and nematode is an excellent example of that. If I were in your shoes, I would find my best and brightest young person who I could get onto a PhD to basically figure out solutions for Guatemala or Central America, and I would look at, you know, who's got the best nematode program? I'd go talk to Dr. Gabisa and basically figure out, you know, where do you place somebody like that and get them going on a local solution, you know, to, to that kind of problem. Um, yes, we, we know that ATA isn't going to roll out to all of the other countries. I still would repeat what I said earlier. I think in the countries we're working in, we need to figure out what are the goals and ambitions of the country and there will be structures that will facilitate that, and there will be structures that we need to figure out and align with. Where are your entry points to support the government-established goals or help? If they don't have the planning done, can we give some help in getting that planning done? 
which is important for us and for them for many reasons. Thank you. Tim and Dennis, um, quick comments? Well, very briefly on the, yes. on the question of maize. Um, I'm an agronomist, but not a breeder. Uh, but having said that, of course, the conservation of biological diversity in farmers' farms and in their own fields is critically important, um, as is conserving and using that germplasm for better bet breeding at a higher level. What I think is important, and I don't think anybody's spoken about it yet, is that I think what we're all really trying to do is scale up choice that farmers have. And that allows access to better seeds, if that's what the farmer is interested in, or access to a land race that is preferred for its taste or what have you. But it's the diversity of choices and bringing that up and allowing marginal farmers who don't always have much more than one or two choices, giving them a palette of options to cho choose from, I think, is where we're all really trying to go. Thanks. Last word, Dennis. I, I think, Mark, uh, thanks for the, that, that comment on ATA. You were one of the, uh, the real early uh, champions of ATA, and I can still remember many times you coming back from meetings with ATA, red-faced, sputtering, and upset about what a bad partner they are in those early days. So that partnership does take, take some time, and there are some fits and starts. But, but for countries without an ATA, uh, you know, it's, it's, you know the, we were joking last week in our mission directors conference, we, we do training for mission directors uh, when, before we become a mission director, and one of the things they tell us is, is kind of, you know, just kind of start with, with, with where you are, Use what you have and do what you can. So that's kind of the same thing in ATA. So, you know, in a, in a place with, with in Kenya, um, I think you've got to look at where you are, and figure out well, can I bolster at least part of a, a wing or a, a unit within uh, the Ministry of Agriculture to really kind of empower it and then kind of a, a beef up its its capacity to to really make those kind of choices. Do the analytics, the empirical evidence that basically shows what you what where you should be going to peel away those layers. And I think. Minister Kalibata in, uh, in, in Rwanda has done just that, I think, as they look at that. They don't have an ATA necessarily like that, but I think they're doing the same sort of analytics, looking at the choices to be made and looking how they convene and, and using the power they've got and, and others have to convene, as, 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 as you said, Jane, kind of the different, different groups together. And that's what it really takes, that convening power to bring them together, get those decisions made. So. Thank you. Okay, here's my hashtag. My hashtag is radical collaboration to invest, to unlock investment and productivity and better nutrition with smallholders. So <laughs> please help me thank this wonderful panel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that wonderful panel. Julie, I especially appreciated your hashtag moderation. Uh, that, that, uh, that will help us, guide us. Um, for a room full of hunger fighters, my next guest really needs no introduction. It is my distinct honor to introduce Representative Jim McGovern, who is currently serving his ninth term in Congress representing Massachusetts. Representative McGovern is a member of the House Agriculture Committee. He is also the co-chair of the House Hunger Caucus. A champion of Feed the Future and global food security efforts, Representative McGovern successfully expanded the McGovern Dole International Food for Education and Child Nutrition Program to help alleviate child hunger and poverty by providing kids better access to nutritious foods in schools around the world. Um, Representative McGovern, we are so delighted to have you come here. I know Crystal City seems, can seem like it's dullest sometimes, so we appreciate you coming down from Capitol Hill to join us. Please join me in welcoming him. Well, thank you, Jada, and thank you for the uh, kind introduction. But in all honesty, I'm the one who is grateful to be here this morning. Uh, I am a member of Congress. I work in that building across the river that is the epitome of dysfunction. Um, but I wanted to come here to tell you that, um, to say thank you. Uh, because what you, are, what you all are doing is working uh, and making an incredible difference. And I always welcome the chance to be among so many good friends and people who care about ending hunger and advancing nutrition. 
ensuring that mothers and their children get the food and nutrition they need to live full, productive, and healthy lives, making sure that when kids go to school that they have the kind of good, healthy meals that allow them to actually learn and take advantage of staying in school. All of you who know that one of all of you know, uh, who know that one out of three people around the world make their living from agriculture, but too many of these small farmers suffer in poverty. All of you who know that many of the small farmers of the world are women, and I'm so happy that we finally discovered women. Um, and uh, and not only can we help and support them, but we can actually learn a lot when we listen, when we listen to what they have to say and the ideas that they have to share. All of you who are dedicated to creating resilient communities that can liter literally weather the kind of economic and climate shocks rocking the world today. So I am, I am so grateful to be with each and every one of you. I'm so glad to have the opportunity to tell you how much I admire and respect all that you do and all that you have accomplished. Uh, in my opinion, you're, you're all rock stars. Uh, and so are your partners around the globe, Those, the, the farmers, the families and teachers and community leaders who with a little help and support have dreamed about a better life, making a commitment and change the lives and the lives of their families and communities. What is happening here is inspirational. But I really want to share with all of you why I made this effort to get across the river and to be with you today. I made the effort because I am excited and I'm very proud. I'm excited by the progress that is being made, the lessons that are being learned, the knowledge that is being shared and applied, the lives that are being changed for the better. And I'm so proud of all of that as well. You know, what you are engaged in, um, to me, represents the best of our country. And when I tell people back in my district in Massachusetts about this, and I want you to know that I do brag about this, to uh, not just the usual suspects, but when I talk to union groups, or chamber of commerce meetings, or small business leaders, or rotary clubs, I talk about this effort, this Feed the Future effort that this country is involved in with partners all around the world, and about the difference that you are making. You know, and, and they're proud of that as well. Because I, you know, I believe, and I think all of you do, that it is possible to end hunger on this planet. Uh, it has always been, it, al it has always, um, <laughs> you know, what, what has been maddening about that issue to me is that we all know what to do, uh, but we haven't mustered the global political will to do it. Hunger is a political condition. I mean, you know, we know what to do. And, um, and, and, and I talk about the, the dedication that all of you have to creating sustainable communities and ending extreme poverty. You know, and, I, and, I, and, and I think we need to get this story out uh, more, quite frankly, because this is the kind of foreign aid that I think is very popular. You know, I know, um, I, you know, I, I, uh, I know how hard it has been to achieve the results that a lot of you are celebrating uh, these, the, uh, this, this day. I know how long it took to get our various government departments and agencies to come together and design a new approach to ending hunger, promoting nutrition and agricultural development, and increase, increasing food security around the world. Getting agencies and departments to work is tough. Getting them to work together is even tougher. But you have established a collaboration here that I think is working very, very well. I know that as programs took place in the focus countries that we learned from best practices. And we learned from lessons from, we also learned lessons from our mistakes and our failures. I know that it was important to put in place the many measures and evaluation tools that we use today to ensure that progress is more than just anecdotal. And here we are today with Monday's progress report spelling out for us how, how far we have come. You know, as someone who has been beating a drum for nutrition, small farmers, women, and resilience to be at the very center of, uh, center of all of our programs and strategies, I am so excited to read about how we turn these words into the very heart of our strategies and priorities. And the results are there for all of us to see. I'm so very excited about the new partnership between Feed the Future and Interaction to expand the program partnerships with civil, civil society. 
and I'm looking forward to, to read the nutrition strategy that will be coming out uh, tomorrow. So I know we have many challenges and, and a long journey ahead. And I think that everyone knows that I want to expand the program, reach more people in the target countries, and, in, and initiate programs in new countries. As I said the other night, if I were Speaker of the House, I'd quadruple Feed the Future's budget. But um, and so here's the here's kind of the the, cha the real challenge, and and what and I and I and I hope that all of you are will be engaged. Uh, and what needs to be done. We need to work to institutionalize the program, not just within USAID, but also to institutionalize the government-wide co coordination that has been a hallmark of this initiative from the very beginning. You know, we need to take this show on the road. You know, I mentioned, I, I talked to my constituents about this, or people who never ever ask about anything we do overseas. And when you talk about this stuff, they, they get really excited. They, they really feel the sense of, you know, that this is a wise investment of their taxpayer dollars. But most of these people don't always know about it. So I need to take this show on the road. Um, I told Raj he should go on Oprah. You know, Mor Morning Joe, The View, maybe Dancing with the Stars, I don't know, whatever, whatever it takes. Um, and when he's not available, some of you should do it. Um, because because there really is a, there is a powerful story to be told here. Um, you know, I listen to the news like all of you do, and, and all we hear about are all the failures and all the, all the things that aren't working. Um, I think it's important not just to focus on that, but to focus on what is working, you know, and the collaborations that have taken place. I know there are many ministers from various countries here as well. I mean, I would encourage you in your home countries to brag about what is going on. I'm a big believer that success breeds success, but we, we need to get the story out. And in Congress, uh, that, is, that is especially important because Congress reacts to public opinion. It reacts to news stories that appear uh, on television. Uh, people get persuaded by that. And, um, you know, and they also react, quite frankly, when you show up in their office and tell them real stories. I had a group that came in to t yesterday to visit me and again, told me about what was going on in there in the countries that they represented. It is important. I'm going to tell you something that may shock some of you, but intelligence is not always a prerequisite for serving in the United States Congress. Um, it is important that you view your role as teachers as well, um, because I think I think we I think we have a we have the possibility here to do something phenomenal, to build on what you have already have already done you know, and make it even bigger and greater. So, you know, being who I am, I'm going to continue to encourage and push and be a bit of a pest to make sure that those areas that still need to be stronger are strengthened and those areas that need to be improved do indeed get better. And that small farmers and women and schools and clinics and families and communities that would like to participate in Feed the Future, uh, agricultural and child nutrition programs get the opportunity to do so. I have traveled to countries, you know, in, in Latin America that really would like more, would like to be part of this Feed the Future initiative. I mean, what, this is, this could be contagious, uh, and this is all good. So much remains to be done. So much more can actually be undertaken. But for today, for this brief moment, I just want all of you to know how proud and excited I am by all that you have accomplished as a United States congressman, as a citizen of this country, as a citizen of this world, this is exactly the type of stuff we should be doing. And quite frankly, we should have been doing it a long time ago. Uh, and so um, I'm gonna do everything I can to, uh, to, to push this, uh, not only amongst my colleagues, but even push the administration to be bolder. Uh, I understand Susan Rice is gonna be giving a speech. I talked to her the other day. We were talking about some of the problems in the world. I said, you gotta talk about Feed the Future. She says, I am. I'm giving a speech on it on Thursday. I said, you gotta tell the president he's gotta talk about this. Next State of the Union address, this ought to be a centerpiece of his speech about what we are doing that is working around the world. You know, um, so. so let me close by simply saying that I genuinely look forward 
to working with all of you inside and outside the government as we continue to feed the future. Uh, and, um, and I'm here to say thank you because people don't say thank you enough uh, in this business. Um, people always tell you what's wrong. They always tell you what you're not doing. Uh, but people never take the time to say thank you. Uh, and so I am here uh, to say a heartful thank you. Um, what you are doing is amazing. Please, please, you know, push this as hard as you can because this really is changing the world for the better. Uh, and, um, and I am in great admiration of all of your work. So thank you for having me here. I hope your conference goes well. Thank you. Thank you, Representative McGovern, for your leadership and for being here today. And, and I must say, if you are a pest, uh, we definitely want more of you. <laughs> so thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Representative McGovern reminded us just now that it is possible to end hunger on this planet. And so um, as we send you off to breakout sessions, I, I want you to keep in mind um, I'd like to remind all of you that we will be transitioning to breakouts followed by a working lunch. Breakouts will conclude at 12.45 p.m., followed by the interest group sessions over the working lunch, which will be marked with signage on the tables. Um, and once again, host country government officials, please join me in Salon 5 for a lunch discussion beginning at 12.50. Um, it is important that you return from lunch and be back in your seats by 2 o'clock sharp so that we can have a great beginning to our afternoon. Um, just, to, just so you know where the breakouts are, there's coffee outside. We ask that you get your coffee quickly and then return for the breakouts, which will start promptly at 11.15. Um, in this room, the policy breakout will be held. There will be a breakout on capacity building next door in Arlington Ballroom 5. And the final breakout on partnering with civil society will be in Ballroom 6. And more detail on the breakout sessions and some of the people that will be participating on those are in your registration packet. Um, so please, go get yourself some coffee and let's get back to the breakouts. Thank you.